Hi everyone. I hope you all are set for the second day. So uh, as I was mentioned in the group, uh, the first thing that we're going to do is first of all, revise what all we studied in the first chapter yesterday. And then we are going to uh, solve the study hub questions. Uh, there were seven, uh, 22 questions in total. So we are going to be solving that. And then we will get on to uh, continuing what we were doing, chapter two. So uh, talking about chapter one first, uh, I want you all to quickly tell me what all did we study about chapter one yesterday? What all do you remember from yesterday's Sorry. class? Okay. What all do you remember from yesterday's class? Any inputs? What all did we cover in chapter one? Okay, that's a very good answer, but um, delving people. How yeah. many decisions are made during the financial management? Okay, so how many are there? Investing. There are three investment, financing, financing, and dividend decisions. So these were the three decisions that we studied about. And um, we also studied about their interrelatability, how taking one decision also impacts the other one. Uh, can any one of you quickly give me an example? Uh, how are these interrelated? Uh, these three decisions, any one example, how taking one decision impacts if, the other one? If we have profits and we are trying to divide it into dividends, we will be able to invest it into any new project and vice versa. So this is a link between which and which decision? Uh, investment decision and uh, dividend decision. Exactly. So I have an answer over here that if we... Uh, give out a lot of dividends, then this is a dividend decision that we take. And at the same time, this affects the financing decision. Why? Because we will be left with no money, uh, sorry, the investment decision, because we will have no money to invest in the project. So this is how the three decisions are also interrelated. These are all related to each other. Um, we also uh, discussed how uh, you know, different parts of these decisions lie into these three categories that we have studied, investment, dividend, and financing. So a quick example from each of you of uh, one one uh, type of uh, decision. So you start with investment. A any example of an investment decision? Um, if you want to acquire some assets. And okay. So okay. Much. Buying of an asset is yeah. an investment decision. You tell me an example of a dividend decision. That's a very common one. Yes. If we are thinking to cut on dividends, that is also a dividend decision. Okay. Uh, no, it's not just to give out dividends will be a dividend decision. If we are, you know, giving, yeah, the change in percentage. If we are trying to cut because we are, you know, probably thinking of investing in a project that we are looking at. So. That as a dividend. So if I'm deciding to reduce the amount of dividends, that's also a dividend decision. Uh, now you tell me an example of a financing decision. Financing, we have ample examples. Okay. Sometimes, so you're telling me the issue of different types of uh, funds, uh, but how much are we sourcing from each of these funds is also an example of a financing decision. If let's suppose uh, I want a uh, hundred million dollars, then perhaps if I am raising uh, 50 million dollars from equity and 50 million dollars from debt, then that's also a financing decision that I'm taking that I, this is the split of my, uh, uh, you know, the investments uh, of the finance that I need. So these were the three decisions that we were talking about yesterday. Just a moment. Right. So uh, then we also discussed the link between financial accounting and management accounting with financial management. So any one of you can let me know how financial accounting impacts financial management. Um, financial accounting is basically preparing the uh, profit uh, or we can say financial statements of the company. And uh, financial management is uh, in order to uh, analyze them and then give the review over it. It's like that. So uh, financial accounting helps us prepare those accounts so that we are able to analyze them in the quarterly. 
so uh, basically what we discussed over here was uh, that whenever uh, so financial accounting is basically about bookkeeping making the preparing the books of accounts so when it comes to such a scenario we also talked about listed companies who also have to consider mm -hmm. their roce how their key ratios are going to look like the return on capital employed so for example if i talk about the cement industry so uh, let's have a hypothetical situation where in the industry about the general companies that are there in the cement industry they have a return on capital employed of 20% but taking up a financing decision an investment decision in your company your return on capital employed is going to be 35% the industry is 20 yours is going to be 35 so that makes it uh, you know a good company for investors to put in money so that will help you raise more finance easily vice versa will be the case if 20 percent is the industry and i uh, my company because of the decisions that i've taken it's fallen down to let's suppose 12 and a half percent so it's very less compared to the industry so investors are not really going to be looking forward to investing in my company that's how financial accounting is something which correlates with financial management whatever we do in financial management is going to affect financial accounting and that's going to also affect our availability of funds and uh, how easily we can raise more funds for our companies. Now let's talk about management accounting. How is it related to management accounting? Any one of you, you tell me. Anyone would like to voluntarily? Now I know what is management accounting, but I don't know how to link. Uh, so we did discuss this yesterday. First of all, you let me know what do we do in management accounting? Like um, day to day expenses, day to day expenses, preparing of budgets, analyzing working capital, uh, working capital, not really decision making process that is done. Yeah. Uh, or yeah. So in management accounting, we basically see how much are we spending on raw materials, how much are we spending on labor, how much are, are other overheads like rent and salaries, administration expenses. So how much are all of these expenses? And, uh, you know, uh, let's suppose in an example, uh, I have estimated that my fixed costs should be $100,000. But when I actually the bills that I have paid, my fixed costs comes out to be, let's suppose, two hundred thousand dollars. So I, because of the management accounts, I know that I was supposed to only spend a hundred thousand, but I ended up spending double the amount that I thought I should be spending. So uh, with this, I know that I have gone over budget, and in the following uh, periods for which I prepare my management accounts, the financial managers will take into consideration that probably we might need more money that, than we think we do. So they will accordingly arrange for finances, probably have some arrangements with the bank, have prior agreements that we might need this money later. So please provide us with that money at that point of time. So this helps you uh, be in a better financial position because otherwise if you're in the middle of production and you do not have money, then you are like left in the middle. You cannot stop, you cannot go ahead. So to avoid such sort of situations, this is how management accounting will help you to uh, plan financial management better. So this is the link between these two uh, accountings that we studied also yesterday. Now, uh, the next thing that we discussed yesterday was strategy. Can anyone quickly tell me what is a strategy? Now, I want an answer from the online batch. Uh, so Nali, you're going to tell me what's a strategy. Ma'am, it's actually the course of action that is done to achieve some objective. Um, Let's say, ki, um, just a rough example on ACCA basis. Like, if we are going, uh, if if we want to clear the FM exam, so we are going to make some strategy, like starting this much hours of self study or attending the classes. Maybe that could be the strategy for achieving that objective. So that's basically right. strategy. So anything, any course of action that you decide to achieve one specific objective mm -hmm. is what you call a strategy. So uh, we had also talked about corporate strategy yesterday. So what's a corporate strategy? yeah so basically it will give you the general direction so if i talk about strategy in terms of a corporate strategy term so it's basically the general direction of the company the example that we discussed yesterday do you uh remember that there was a 
car manufacturing company which had the objective of switching to sustainable energy so that is their corporate objective that's their general direction everything that they do in the coming years in the years that they have to achieve this ob uh, objective is going to be targeted towards achieving that objective so this is what a strategy will tell you corporate strategy will give you the general direction of where you are going uh, then we also talked about financial objectives. What was the biggest financial objective that we... Uh, yeah, uh, yes, exactly. So I have an answer here that maximization of the wealth of the shareholders was something which we uh, thought that was the biggest financial objective of a company. Now, when we talk about the uh, total shareholder wealth, what were the two components that we had learned yesterday of the total shareholder wealth? Uh, Sorry. Sorry. Yes. You're telling me the formula. There were two components. One was dividends. Dividends, definitely. And one was, I guess, share price. Yes, exactly. Capital so you can, gain. Yeah, exactly. That's a capital gain. So you, the, the return that you generate of a company is basically in two parts. First is the dividend that it pays you. It comes directly to your bank accounts if any one of you invests in stock market. And the capital gains are nothing but the difference at which uh, the price that you paid to buy the stock and the price that it is trading at currently. So that's uh, what your cap. It can also be a loss. So for example, if a share that you bought at 100 rupees and now it's trading in the market for 90 rupees, so 10 rupees is your capital capital loss in that in that scenario. So this is what we uh, talked about when uh, it was about strategy. And we also had the formula yesterday. Can anyone give me the formula? Share price at the end of the year. Yes. Minus share price at the starting of the year. Plus okay. dividend paid upon share price at the starting of the year into. So this is the first component that we talked about, right? Yeah. This is the capital gain component. And I will add what? The dividend. dividend. So this entirely is what I have gotten back from my investment. And I will divide this with the initial investment to find out the percentage return which I have earned. So the percentage return of uh, uh, the share price at the start. And if I multiply this with 100, I will have it in a percentage term. Please bear with me with this. Oh, let me Okay, so uh, this was the formula that we learned yesterday. Then we also talked about the NPOs. Uh, NPOs are what? Not for profit organizations. And uh, what did we discuss about them? Do they have just one objective or do they have multiple objectives? Multiple objectives and can they conflict with each other? Yes. Definitely, yes, because you, so we studied this yesterday that whenever we have multiple objectives, so I gave you an example also to support this. Suppose I have an NGO that works towards empowerment of women. So to do that, I am providing for the education of children and another arm does for providing job opportunities to elder women. So perhaps if I'm focusing more towards resources or uh, towards the education, perhaps the other sector is suffering because I'm concentrating more over there, putting more resources over there. So the objectives can conflict also. Uh, these both objectives are no doubt for the help of the people, but because I'm concentrating more on one part and not on the other part, so uh, there also arises a conflict. So uh, we have learned that there will be multiple objectives and these objectives can also conflict. conflict. So this is what we learned about uh npos and how do we evaluate their performance we also discussed how measuring their performance is difficult but there were three three e's that help us to evaluate their performance what were the three e's economy efficiency effectiveness can anyone quickly tell me what these three terms mean Economy means uh, minimizing the value of whatever we are. The doing. inputs. Minimizing the cost of your inputs is called economy. And what do we mean by efficiency? Maximizing the output to input ratio. So for 
the same amount of input getting more generating more output is what will make me more efficient and then if we talk about effectiveness this was about using the resources effectively so these are the three e's that will help you to measure the performance of an npo because otherwise these are more or less in qualitative terms and when it something is in a qualitative term it's difficult to measure so perhaps if uh, uh, you know someone has told you that i have an output of 1000 kgs another person tells you i have an output of 1200 kgs so it's easier to compare that the one who has produced 1200 kgs has done better he has produced more but if i tell you uh, i have i'm so good at this thing i'm so bad at that thing so if, if it's a qualitative thing it's difficult to compare because you do not really have any numbers to support your analysis so that's why the more you are able to quantify your objectives your performance measures the easier it's going to become to evaluate the performance uh, this is what we discussed about npos then we also talked about the agency theory anyone remembers the agency theory what do uh, what did we talk about over here that shareholders are the principal right and the manager and actors um, are the agents they are work the for agents. the shareholders right. Right. So the agents have been appointed, the managers and directors have been appointed by the shareholders to work on their behalf because they have their own jobs to do. They cannot come to the company regularly to manage the affairs of the company. So that's why they have on their behalf appointed someone to work and generate money on their money. So this is what we learned about agency theory. Then we also talked about a few stakeholders that the companies have. So one of you is going to give me uh, one one stakeholder each. So I'm going to start from here now. Uh, employees, yeah, employees are one stakeholders. What did they want from the company? They wanted job security, a good working environment, and a pay, a good pay. Uh, then another stakeholder? Um, manager or public in general. So managers are one stakeholders. Again, they could also be clubbed with the employees, but we studied them separately also. So what they want is power, they want esteem, and they want recognition, and they want their bonuses, their pay also. Another stakeholder, please? Public. <laughs> okay, so the general public is also a stakeholder because whatever we do, community at large is also our stakeholders oh. definitely yes uh finance providers are also one of the stakeholders yeah. and uh yeah so trade creditors so uh, both of these are two separate people finance providers are the ones who give us loans for longer period of time this could be a bank this could be general financial public yeah financial institutions and if we have issued uh, debentures so the debenture holders are also our finance providers so these people are concerned with more of our overall picture long-term picture because they have given us money for a longer period of time but if i talk about the trade creditors these are more concerned about them or let's suppose 10 20 days later so they are more concerned with the short-term working of the business so these are two uh, different stakeholders that we also talked about uh, can you give me more examples of stakeholders uh, definitely shareholders are biggest uh, you know people who because of which the company is formed and is working so these were the few stakeholders that we talked about another example could be the taxation authorities so the government and taxation authorities these are also concerned that we are following the rules and regulations that are laid down by them and we are paying our taxes on time so uh, these were the stakeholders that we talked about then uh, Probably the last thing that we talked about uh, yesterday was about corporate governance. So anyone can give me the definition or like corporate governance, like rules and regulations um, laid by the company uh, so that they can direct and control the yeah direction and control is definitely what forms a part of corporate governance but this is not written anywhere this is more more or less what you see in the company so how the directors how the uh, you know the people who are running the company the board of directors how they are controlling and directing the activities that take place in the organization is how uh, you will say that this is the system through which they direct exactly. and control their organization so this is what we meant by corporate governance we also discussed a few principles of good corporate governance that what should be there in the company so that the corporate governance would be good so can you give me uh, from here now some examples appoint 
uh, yes, definitely. NEDs should be there in the company on the board. So there will be Look equal number them. of uh, executives mm -hmm. as well as independent non-executives. Uh, another one. Another one. Yeah, no director should be involved in setting his own mm -hmm. remuneration because there will be a conflict of self-interest. You will mm -hmm. also study this when you study double A. So obviously, if I am setting my own salary, I would want to pay myself more. So uh, uh, this is another principle of good corporate governance. And one very important thing, which was also the first point probably that we studied yesterday, was that your chairman and your CEO should be two separate people. This should not be the same person. Um, now what will happen if both are the same? So if both are the same person, basically chairman is supposed to be an independent person who's supposed to look after that uh, uh, things are going on as they should go on. Uh, a chief executive is more of a person who's doing uh, the day-to-day -day things to maximize the profitability. So he might even try to tweak the rules and regulations somewhat in his favor so that he's able to achieve a higher profit, let's suppose, or a higher bonus for himself because their bonuses are mostly linked to profits. So that is why it becomes important to separate these two people because if the same person is doing this task, he will definitely go on towards maximization of his self-interest and would not probably check whether we are compliant with the, how the things are supposed to go. That is why these should be two separate people. Uh, anything else that you remember, how can governance be good? By giving uh, yes, okay. Uh, so that was uh, under the managerial uh, rewards that we studied, how we can minimize them prioritizing their self-interest. Uh, you were saying? Um, uh, maybe I learned it in AA or maybe I don't okay. know. There should be personal, uh, no personal interest of the auditors or you know. Uh, yes, yes. The... Uh, this can also form a part of corporate governance. So when you are appointing the shareholders of the company, the, uh, sorry, the external auditors, those people who will be auditing based on whose report we will be publishing our financial statements in the market. So these people should be totally independent. You should not be offering them. Uh, so uh, you would have seen that uh, in your school when uh, the board vivas and practicals were conducted our teachers the external who used to come yes. from outside our teachers used to like you know uh, give them with all of the snacks and uh, everything so just so that they give you good marks so the, in the practical world how you should not be you know giving your auditors with some benefits perhaps if i'm uh, let's suppose i'm the client of the auditor and i have a hotel chain i have a very good luxury hotel and i uh, am you know indirectly offering them that you give me a nice report and i'm going to give you a family stay for a week and uh, you know in my best luxury room so this is something which is not allowed by law also so this is completely prohibited in all of the countries. Uh, those of you who, who would have studied about double A little, you would know this, that uh, the auditor is not supposed to accept anything of a trivial monetary value. So uh, yeah. yeah, they should not have any ownership in the co uh, company. So all of the people who work for auditing firms, they're not supposed to hold the shares of the company that they're auditing. So even the subsidiary, if suppose uh, there's a big company and it has some investments in other companies, which are significant investments. So they're also not supposed to buy the shares of the investments also. So they have to be completely be uh, by, uh, you know, bias less. They should not have any sort of bias. They should be auditing the company as it should be. No, any, uh, no sort of any biases. So uh, this is, uh, perhaps all that we covered yesterday. There was one more formula that we uh, had done, which was about EPS. So can any one of you give me that formula? Profit after tax minus right. number of shares. Dividing by the number of shares. Now, again, let's try to break this formula down. How does, so first of all, let's look at what we are trying to calculate. EPS is what? Earnings, Earnings per, per share. share. So basically, if I have 10 shares and I've earned 100 rupees, so if I see on one share, I've earned how much? 10, 10 rupees. So we are trying to look at how much I have earned per share. On one share, what's my earning? So basically, profit. Uh, if you see the financial statements, you'll have sales. You'll subtract what? 
uh, to find out the profits. Cost, cost. The cost. So there will be fixed cost. There will be variable cost. Then you get your gross profit. Then you subtract any other uh, any other expenses. So then you arrive at your net profit. Now with this net profit, uh, so you will be subtracting your let's suppose any sort of interest payments that you have. Then after the interest payments, you are left with PBIT. Oh, sorry, PBT. PBT. Uh, so PBT will give you the profit before tax. Now all of your finance costs have been paid off. Now this is the money that you're left with before paying the taxes. Now whatever, let's suppose I have a 20% tax rate. So if I subtract 20%, then uh, I will arrive at my profit after tax. Now uh, the profit that I'm left with after tax, who are the people who have the right over this profit? shareholders and we we could also potentially have two sorts of shareholders one could be the preference shareholders and one could be the equity shareholders so who will get the preference the preference shareholders so anything that i have so when i have my profit after tax the next thing that gets subtracted is the preference dividend so anything, any return, any sort of dividend that I'm paying to my preference shareholders, that also gets paid off. And then, you know, the bichare uh, equity shareholders will get whatever is remaining. So uh, basically, that is what our numerator is in this formula of EPS. This will be the profit, essentially, that is left for the equity shareholders and that you divide so the total profit is something that you have earned on the total number of shares that the company has an issue and that will be divided by the total number of shares to find out what's the profit on one share because eps aims to find out exactly that per share so uh, this is how you break down the formula and understand why exactly we are putting what in numerator and denominator so uh, any queries from this entire chapter I hope that it is more clear now after revising. Uh, so I will be taking you to the study hub. Uh, so we, uh, every one of you is going to get a chance to answer the question and then I'm going to be uh, debriefing that. So let's get started. Uh, you go on with the first question. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the ones who have joined online, please, you guys also keep dropping your answers in the chat box. Ma'am, actually, I've already done the question, so I know. Okay, no worries. You can uh, keep answering. I'm going to anyway explain all of this. Um, uh, right. So let's first read out, read out the question. Which of the following is never consistent? Please, this is the first time that we are solving any sort of a question in the class. So I'm going to be letting you know what all you have to keep in your mind while you're answering section A and section B questions. So over here, you have to select the negative thing, which is not consistent. So at many times in ACC exams, you will find questions that will specify whether you have to find something which is or something which is not. Usually they highlight that. Over here also they have capitalized never so that you your mind gets on to the fact that you have to select an option which is not the case that they have specified. So which of the following is never consistent with the objective of maximizing shareholder wealth? Now let's go option by option. Let us keep eliminating the one which could not be the answer and uh, then we will move on to uh, identifying which could be the answer. So I have uh, the answer. Let's go to option A, following corporate social responsibility. Is it something which will in the long term help me maximize shareholder wealth? Yes. So this cannot be the answer because I'm looking for something which is not going to help me do that. If I am following social responsibility, the people around me, the community is going to think I'm a good business. I'm going to keep getting uh, investments in my company and this will ultimately help me maximize the wealth of my shareholders. Now, if I talk about increasing sales levels, increasing sales levels is also something increasing profits and ultimately the wealth. So this can also not be the answer. Then we have a word saying satisficing do you first understand what this word means no. satisficing means just doing the bare minimum so if i'm supposed to do a work duck i've done it mm -hmm. this is satisficing is this something which is going to help me maximize the wealth of the shareholders this will not 
yeah so this this becomes a, a possible answer which we can have let's also read d and then we will decide our final answer paying dividends so if we pay dividends ultimately we are you know increasing the total shareholder return so we are helping with maximization of the wealth of our shareholders so c becomes your answer uh, moving on to the is question one clear to all of you all of you yes ma'am uh can i have a confirmation from online students also great i move on to question number 2 now which of the following you are going to answer this which of the following is a sign that a company is failing to maximize the wealth of their shareholders um what is your guess i guess c okay so let's go option by option over here also the first option says management has challenging performance bonuses so what do we mean by this the management the bonus the criteria that they have so probably if the company is uh, having let's suppose 120 million dollars of profits and the target that is set for them so uh, probably the shareholders are saying that we will give you a bonus if you achieve let's suppose 400 million dollars of profits so it's a very challenging performance target right so if the management has such targets probably they are going to feel demotivated that this is something which we will never be able to achieve so this is they are probably not going to work towards uh, you know the job that they are supposed to so this will not help you uh, you know uh, to uh, get to the targets then investment decisions are evaluated on the basis of their net present value uh basically uh we will be studying net present value later also so when we talk about the net present value uh it will be the total value the absolute increase that the shareholders are going to get in their wealth uh, as a result of adopting that project so the npv technique is actually a very good technique to appraise investment projects that is why this will help to maximize the wealth of the shareholders the company has not diversified its operations so uh, uh it is not really necessary that a company does diversify can't be used to focus very yeah close. yeah so uh, if the company is actually focusing on what they are good at they'll probably be able to generate good profits and uh, you know ultimately maximize the wealth of their shareholders then the last option says financing of the company is via equity finance alone so yesterday we studied that when we use debt the interest that we pay on debt is tax deductible we first subtract the interest on our debt and then we uh, pay out the tax with uh, whatever the amount is left so if i am not taking the advantage of debt finance i am depriving my shareholders of the benefits that they could reap because of employing debt in the business that is why this option is something which will you know fail to maximize the wealth of the shareholders that would see good also be the answer uh so the, if you talk about in relativity uh, if you talk about in relativity you are depriving your shareholders from the benefits that they get as a result of using the debt uh, talking about c as she uh, rightly pointed out that uh, it is not necessary that they should have to diversify to maximize their wealth probably if they think to diversify their business uh, because maybe i am uh, you know presently working in the construction industry i am thinking to diversify into let's suppose providing financial services mm -hmm. do i have any expertise do i have any experience in that so will i be able to do good at that so this is something which is not necessary that only diversification is going to help to maximize the wealth of the shareholders all those we do yeah yeah so if focusing on current business can also help you and talking about the a1 again so there can also be a scenario where let's suppose uh, that uh, you know the uh, targets are challenging so the managers also feel motivated to work towards it probably to uh, you know in the the thought that they will be getting higher bonuses so probably if no it's it's not a very uh, hard target to achieve so if it's a target that is uh, relatively you know something which is humanly possible so then they will be definitely motivated to work towards it and ultimately help in maximizing the 
wealth of the shareholders. That's why option D is the most feasible mm -hmm. answer over here, because when we are only using equity finance, we are depriving the shareholders of the benefits of using debt in the business. And as a result, there will be no that advantage. Uh, using debt as a source of financing would either uh, like reduce the profits, overall profits of the shareholders, right? So uh, let me give you an example over here. Uh, it's a good question that you asked. So perhaps my total profit, I am talking about two situations over here, one with completely equity and the other situation with equity plus debt. So let's suppose my uh, present uh, PBIT is uh, 100. Let's suppose in both of the cases, the PBIT is the same. Then let's suppose over here I have no debt. So the interest is going to be zero. So interest is going to be zero. Now let's suppose over here I have some debt and due to that debt, the interest payment that I make is 10. So uh, what I'm left with over here is over here I have 100 and over here I have 90. Now this is my PBT, profit before tax. Now on this value, I'm going to pay the tax. So tax, let's suppose is uh, 30%. Yes. So over here, it will be 30. And ho over here, it will be 27. what 27. So what's the uh, what's left for the shareholders here. So if you see that over here, we actually ended up paying more taxes. And uh, let's suppose the total capital structure of the company and over here. Said in class yeah, so that, exactly. This was there in business ended. studies in class 11 also, where both of the examples were discussed as a case study. So let's suppose if you have a uh, $100 million worth of capital. So over here, let's suppose you have 100 shares in issue. And over here, because you have some part in debt and some part in equity, let's suppose 50 is debt and 50 is equity. So uh, I'm as this is a very simple example. So I'm assuming that one uh, rupees is the nominal value also. So over here, this 70 rupees that is left gets divided among 100 people. Mm -hmm. uh, what is uh, the answer that you get on 70 divided by 100? 0 0.7. And over here, this 63 rupees that you are left with gets divided between how many people? 50 people. What is 63 divided by 50? 1.2. 1.2. 1.2. Uh, you can work this out on the calculator. So over here, you will find out that Even per person more. over here gets only 70 pesa. And in the second case where we are using debt, one person is getting 1.26. So just because of the fact that we had this small amount of interest payment that we made that affected uh, the tax that we paid. And ultimately, the money that was left for the shareholders were more per share. Is it clear yes. now? So this is how using debt, you are able to also give benefit of debt to the shareholders. So that's why option D is going to be your answer. Uh, now I'm going to uh, give question number three to an online student. I'm going to call out a name. Shreya is going to answer question number three. Shreya, are you there? Yes, ma'am. So can you also read out the question and then give me your answer? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Which of the following are not usually considered to be agency costs? Costs associated with the giving share options to managers, cost of monitoring managers, cost of obtaining a listing on the stock exchange, cost of divergent behaviors by managers. Um, C number. Okay, so your answer is option C. Let's also discuss. So if you remember, we were covering agency costs yesterday. And what we studied was that because uh, the shareholders are, uh, you know, causing the managers to be agents, there is a possibility that these agents try to put their own interest before the interest of the shareholders, even though originally shareholders have appointed them to work in their place. But there is a possibility that they place their interests over the shareholders. So in such a scenario, we are incurring agency costs. These are the costs of the, you know, some any manipulation that they do. Uh, uh, do you remember we were discussing about manipulation of the books of accounts? So mm -hmm. probably in the short term, they do that 
that but then in the long term that's going to be uh, causing cost to the shareholders so agency cost is any sort of that cost which is there due to this agency relationship due to the fact that they are not the real owners they only get their fixed pro, uh, salaries that is why they will be uh, motivated to probably tweak the books of accounts in their favor probably try to increase the profits because their uh, bonus is usually a percentage of the profit so the profit will be more their bonus will also be more because it's a percentage so uh, any sort of cost which is incurred because of this agency relationship is called the agency cost so the first option says cost associated with giving share options to managers again this is one cost which we are incurring to minimize this problem so again this is a cost which we are indeed incurring to uh, curb the agency costs so, so again this will be a part of agency cost is this clear to all of you any queries please ask okay then part b is again cost of monitoring mm -hmm. managers monitoring is definitely needed because they are actually agents and not the real owners of the company then cost of obtaining listing on the stock exchange does listing have anything to do with agency problem not at all so this could be one potential answer let's read d option also cost of divergent behavior by managers so divergent behavior basically means that they are doing something which they are not supposed to do so this is again a cause of the agency cost so all option a b and d these all are indeed agency costs and we have to select which is not the agency cost so option c becomes your answer over here is this clear to all of you uh, online students you want me to explain c again yeah. so the cost that you incur on obtaining a listing on the stock exchange so basically uh let's suppose i am a company i'm trying to list myself on the stock exchange so before i can actually list myself and my shares are traded on the stock exchange there's going to be a whole lot of documents that i'm supposed to furnish in the stock exchange uh if you have heard about the securities in exchange board of india sebi it has laid down a lot of paperwork that you need to submit in order to be able to list yourself on the stock exchange so all of those costs there are also usually underwriting costs because what happens if nobody subscribes to my shares who is going to buy option. so the underwriters are the ones who take the responsibility that if the market does not buy your shares i am going to buy your shares so that your issue does not uh, you know fail so the issue has to succeed that is why the underwriters uh, promise you that if nobody buys your shares i will buy your shares so there is a cost that you have to pay to them to give this guarantee also so all of these costs are something which will be the cost that will be incurred in getting listed on the stock exchange uh, and this has nothing to do with the agency problem that is why uh, sorry underwriters underwriters, underwriters. So is this clear to all of you now? Yes. Any queries at all, please ask. Uh, a confirmation from the online students also, please. Is this question clear to all of you? Great. So we move on to the next question now. Which of the following is least likely to solve the agency problem between shareholders and managers? Uh, I'm going to pick a name. Uh, Hardik is going to answer this. Please read the question and then give me your answer. Uh, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Great. Yes, ma'am. Which of the following leads likely to solve the agency problem between the shareholders and the option A, even manager, profit listed to work, using the system of the first to guard the company performance, maybe a respective on the environment. Into loan uh, 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 what do you think the answer is? It's okay even if you give me the wrong answer. We are just uh, trying to learn over here. What do you think the answer is? Uh, Okay, you think the answer is D. Uh, let's go option by option and try to understand what uh, the statement says. So first of all, we have to identify something which is again least likely, which is not likely to solve the agency problem. Agency problem again, which we were solving earlier also, that the fact that the managers will probably try to manipulate so that they get more money and will 
keep the interests of the shareholders second uh, so if uh, this the first option that we have over here giving managers profit related awards rewards so this was something which we studied yesterday in solving the agency problem this was one solution that we had definitely if we link them uh, so if they have an incentive that they will get more bonus if they get a higher profit if the company achieves a higher profit then they are more likely to work towards achieving a higher profit and then eventually because they are also getting a share in whatever the company is making so this is something which can help you solve this problem that's why this is not the answer then option b is using external auditors to gauge company performance so like we were discussing just right now that uh, the managers are the people who ultimately prepare the books of accounts right it's the people who are under the managers probably the cfo is going to be overlooking these people so it's again internal people who are going to be creating the books of accounts so it is pretty much possible that they tweak they make certain changes to show probably if something uh, there's some inflow and they'll probably not show it and divide that among themselves so these are a few examples of frauds that they can commit which can uh, hamper the profits that the shareholders enjoy because otherwise if they had recorded that in their books of accounts they would have uh, the shareholders would have gotten benefit of the profits that the company was making so external auditors are actually the people who are responsible to give you a reasonable assurance that whatever the management is saying they have done the right things it's the audit is also definitely not a 100% guarantee no one can give you a 100% guarantee that out of let's suppose if we talk about a very big company probably microsoft google these companies would have billions of transactions in an entire year so no auditor can really trace back all of those billion transactions and give you the 100% assurance that all of things which are mentioned over here are correct so auditors will also only give you a reasonable assurance but definitely any fraud any big thing which they are trying to commit would be something that they will be able to catch and report to the shareholders because auditors have no interest in the company whatsoever so they'll be telling the truth uh so this is also something which will help you solve the agency problem basically you can think that these are the shareholders and managers are basically two people who are dating and they have trust issues they do not trust that you know they are probably uh, telling each other the truth so the, then the third option says writing restrictive covenants into loan note contracts so uh, do you understand the statement first of all I do not expect you to. I found this odd one out, so I <laughs> do you first of all understand what the statement means? Because I do not expect you to understand this. No? Okay. So let's uh, dive deep into the statement. So loan note contracts, do you know what are loan note contracts? So basically, no, if I am a company, if I am a company, yeah, that's very good answer. Yeah. So, something related to loan definitely it has to be so if i am a company and i am in need of money i am trying to probably so loan notes debentures these are more or less interchangeable terms if i need money i am offering to the general public to subscribe to my loan notes to buy my loan notes and in return those loan notes are there can be two options either uh, so let's suppose if it is priced at 100 rupees i could either sell it for 95 now and when they get to redeem they will have full 100 rupees so 5 rupees is the benefit that they get and the second possibility is that they buy it at 100 but every year i give them uh, five five rupees as interest and then at the redemption i give back the initial amount also do you get the two scenarios right so these are the two possible scenarios in which you can use loan notes so now i am uh, issuing, uh, you know, issuing these loan notes to the people. So if I have restrictive, so basically banks also provide these uh, sort of uh, things so that the business can raise money. So if uh, there are so restrictive covenants, based covenants is basically a requirement. That it's it's a, uh, yeah, it's a requirement in the agreement which is mentioned that this is something which you need to fulfill. Otherwise, the agreement goes null and void. This is something which you will have to really do so uh, if uh, then restrictive covenants so uh, restrictive basically means that is stopping you from doing something so if you have such sort of an agreement uh, such sort of a clause in your loan note contracts uh, you know the probably let's suppose there's a bank that has given you money 
on the condition that you are not supposed to have more debt in the future but you are having more debt and you, so that the agreement goes null and void and whatever source of uh, you know the funds that the bank has given you you have to immediately return all that back so do you think this has anything to do with the agency problem so perhaps this will not really solve the agency problem let's move on to the d part and then ultimately if this gets eliminated then we are left with option c monitoring managers actions definitely this was something which we were discussing what are the solutions of the agency problems so if we are continuously monitoring what they are doing uh, continuously see overseeing that you know they are doing the things which they are supposed to and nobody is doing anything which they are not supposed to be doing so this is also something which can help you solve or lesser the agency problem that is why a b and d are possible solutions so they are not your answer and option c becomes your answer restrictive covenants repeating again are any sort of a a clause in the agreement which limits the managers from doing something so this cannot really be helpful in so it can help uh, solve the problems between the managers and the trade creditors or the loan providers but it cannot help you solve the problem between shareholders and the managers do you agree with me on this all of you okay so option c is our answer is this clear to all of you clear okay so we move on to the last one option c was our answer right so uh you give me the answer question five yeah read the question and then give me the answer which of the following statement about value for money is correct? A. Economy is minimizing the input cost of the organization. Mm -hmm. B. Efficiency is minimizing the output input ratio. Mm -hmm. Effectiveness is minimizing the cost of meeting the organization objectives. D. Enhancement is maximizing in input output ratios. What do you think the answer is? The online folks can also leave a com uh, like a answer in the chat box. No cheating, guys. It's very easy. Not at all. You're guessing B as your answer. Okay. So over here, we have to identify which statement is correct about value for money. So what are the three E's, first of all, that we have learned in value for money? Effectiveness, right. So the first thing that we studied was uh, economy. And what did we learn economy was? Minimizing the cost that we pay for inputs, which is exactly the first statement. So this becomes the correct statement, isn't it? Now also let's see why B, C, D are incorrect. B says efficiency is minimizing the input uh, output to input ratio. Whereas what we have studied about efficiency, yeah, maximizing. maximizing. So the examiner is going to play with words. You know, everything else in the statement seems correct. But if you to exam, you know, you may be nervous in the exam. You may be hurrying in the exam because of time running out. You may ignore this minimizing. You may read it as maximizing mm -hmm. for any sort of reason. And you may mark this as your answer. But please, whenever you're marking, MCQs, be, be very careful, double check, double read. There's no harm in doing that because it's either two or it's either zero. You do not get, even if you have to select two statements and one of them is correct, you still get a zero. It's either two or zero, do or die. So please read the statements very carefully. Uh, option B is eliminated here to all of you. Then if we talk about option C, effectiveness is minimizing the costs of the organization's objectives. Is it what we have studied? Maximum. Effectiveness is actually, no, we do not also maximize the cost, but effectiveness is using the resources effectively. So whatever the resources the organization has, we are making sure that whenever they are needed, we are using them. Nothing goes to waste. So uh, this is also something which cannot be the answer. Option D talks about a whole another E, which is not there in the three E's that we have studied. Enhancement is no, uh, you know, the thing that we have studied in value for money. So again, this is something which cannot be the answer. Uh, Ma'am, in option B, if it, if it would be that efficiency is minimizing the input output ratio, then it would be correct. 
uh, in output. your numerator it's supposed to be output and in your denominator it's supposed to be input and this ratio is supposed to be maximized no but if it says that input and output ratio is minimizing input upon output okay, ratio. he's saying that if it is vice versa okay uh, that could be the case but it's better if you say that you are supposed to maximize the output to input ratio yes. yeah so that's why statement statement a is something which we straight off see is something which exactly we have read and studied. So mm -hmm. this has to be correct. Uh, with this, we are done with the quiz. Now let's move on to the practice section. Uh, for chapter one, I think we only have the OT revision questions uh, and we have a revision case also. So we are for now doing the OT revision questions. These are 17 in total. And I think all of you are going to get your chances now. This is a very easy question. Who wants to answer this? OK, you go. You have answered. We'll come back to you. Yeah. Um, efficiency. Uh, so first, read the question. Which three of the following relate to the value for money concept? A, earnings. B, efficiency. C, equity. B, effectiveness. E, evaluation. F, economy. So this is a very straightforward question. Yeah, efficiency, right? B is effectiveness and F is economy. So these are the three E's that we have learned in value for money. I hope nobody has a doubt in this one. Okay. Uh, moving ahead. Which of the following is most consistent with maximizing shareholder wealth? I'm going to ask uh, Arun to answer this. Arun, are you here with us? Arun, are you here? Zeba? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, read the question and give me your answer. Which of the following is most consistent with maximizing shareholder wealth? Profit maximization, market share growth, minimizing the company's cost of capital, maximizing earnings per share. Hmm. Maximizing earnings per share, I guess, option D. Uh, OK, so before we discuss this, I am going to take you back over here to discuss something with you. So this is something that we're going to be studying uh, in the further classes also. So there's a concept of cost of capital. Uh, cost of capital essentially means so perhaps if I'm a business, I have some equity and some finance in uh, sorry some debt in my capital structure so let's suppose 50 million dollars i have equity 50 million dollars i have debt so there are different costs that will be associated with these sources of finance probably the debt is from a bank and the bank is charging me 9% interest annually so what is 9% this is the cost of my debt this is the cost that I'm incurring to have that money with me, to use that money in my investments. This is the cost that I have to bear. So this becomes what? The cost of my debt, right? Are you getting it? Are you with me on this, all of you? Then let's suppose my equity shareholders uh, demand a return from me. And these equity shareholders are demanding, let's suppose, 13% return annually. So if they have invested 100 rupees in year zero at the end of the year they will want 113 rupees back so this is the cost of my equity so basically to find out how much i have to earn to just meet the cost forget about having anything extra left within the company for further use i have to meet these two costs so 13 percent of uh, 50 million how much will that be can anyone quickly work this out Six point five. Okay, and nine percent of fifty. Okay, so this is uh, six point five plus four point five. This is the minimum amount of profit that I'm supposed to make if I have to continue my business. Otherwise, they are going to come back and take away their money from me. So. Uh, the 13% and the 9% essentially, if I just uh, average them out to find out my exact cost, uh, how much my exact cost will be 13% uh, into 0.5 plus 9% into 0.5. How much will this be? 
eleven percent. So on an average, eleven percent is the cost of my capital. What if I have a hundred rupees? I have to make them a hundred and eleven in order to be able to continue my business. So. whatever the uh, and also when we talk about the value of a company how will you value a company if you have to find out how much a company is worth um equity plus debt will give you okay that's one method of valuation what are some other ways there are multiple ways of valuation uh, A, a lot of people also use sales as right. the valuation so method right. sales into whatever the ratio that they think is uh, you know good enough some people will use profits to value the company byju's got a very good valuation because of its future prospects because thinking that you know how much the company will be able to make in the coming years of time is how they value the company so mm -hmm. this is another way so what we will be also learning in financial management over here is that the value of a company will be equal to the present value of all the future cash flows so the future cash flows are going to be in the future after 10 years 5 years this is what the company is going to make but how much is it worth today because if a burger is worth 100 rupees today will a burger be worth 100 rupees in 5 years you'll have to pay more why is that inflation in the economy that's a very simple you know explanation if today i'm buying a toffee for 1 rupees probably in the future it's going to cost me 5 rupees because of the effect of inflation so to find out the value of a company you are going to see how much it's going to make in the years to come and in those years whatever the money that it's making what is it worth today if i am give uh, so let's suppose uh, let me give you two options so i have to pay you 100 rupees i give you an option that either you take 100 rupees for, from me now or you take 96 rupees in the future so what are you going to choose 100, 100 right so there is a present consumption of so even if i offer you 100 rupees in the future what are you going to opt for today because why there are so th there is also a concept of time value of money since you all have been exempted from management accounting exam uh, i will have to uh, cover that with you uh, you know to make you understand why exactly there's a time value attached with money so uh, the reason why you are preferring money today so there is there are three reasons for time value of money first of all there is a preference for present consumption so probably uh, you want that money now because you are thinking to buy yourself something with those 100 rupees so the, the reason why you prefer 100 rupees now is because you want to consume something so there is one reason another reason is the risk factor i am promising to give you 100 rupees one year later but what if i run away there's a risk right so because to minimize that risk you will say okay you you give me 90 but give it to me today i want it right now i i am fearing that you will run away i will lose with the entire 100 rupees so give me 90 and let me go so this is about the risk and the third thing is the inflation sorry the value of money yeah the value of money which depreciates over time because of inflation uh, again the same example that if you go out to buy something today one year later it's not going to be available at the same price it's going to be slightly higher because of the inflation so these are basically the three reasons why people prefer to have money in their hands today rather than having it at a later date so if i tell you that uh, you're going to get 500 rupees 2 years later they are not going to be worth 500 rupees of today Uh, perhaps if you are able to buy a shirt with 500 rupees today maybe 5 years later you're not going to be able to buy the shirt maybe you're going to need 600 or 700 to buy that same shirt because of inflation so these are the three basic reasons that is why we discount money so if i have to find uh, if i tell you that you are going to receive 500 rupees 5 years later how much will it be worth today how much money is it in today's time so that will be a little lesser amount because 500 uh, rupees uh, in the future are going to be uh, you know lesser than what you can buy with 500 rupees today so uh, we also have the discounting tables i will explain that to you once the need uh, arises once we are closer to that so uh, whatever uh, how we value a company is basically what all it's going to earn and we discount it today to find out how much it is worth today the 5 million dollars that you're going to receive after 10 years is not going to be the same as 5 million dollars in today's time 
So you discount that discount for the risk, for the inflation, for the preference of present consumption to find out how much that money is worth in today's value. Do you get what I'm trying to say? So this is what we mean uh, with the concept of time value of money. So when we talk about the valuation of a company, if you are thinking that the company is going to make this much money over this period of time, so to find out what is the value today, you're going to have to discount those cash flows. So those cash flows discounted, added together will give you the value of the company, how much the company is capable to make. Uh, so again, let's go back to the question. Uh, also, if you see, um, let me just take you to the discount tables now itself. Uh, another thing also over here is, uh, you can also say investment. So you will also prefer to receive the money now because you also have the option to put it in a fixed deposit that's going to give you interest on that. So uh, probably if you get the money one year later, you will not have the option of earning the interest that you will earn on putting that money into the FD. That is why also people prefer to receive money today instead of a few years later. Well, it comes under the point of preference. Right. Yeah, yeah, but for preference, basically, you're saying that you are going to consume it today. You're probably going to buy something with it today. But investment is you're going to keep it in a fund that's going to give you interest on that. So if you see over here, uh, these are the discount tables. I hope they've not removed it. They have. <laughs> I may have it for management accounting as well. Yeah, so over here we have the present value table. So basically, if I tell you that uh, I owe you 100 rupees and there is an option that with you, the bank is offering 10% interest on the deposit. So you will prefer that either I give you 100 rupees now or give you 110 rupees in the future because this is what you will be possibly able to achieve if I give you 100 rupees no. today. So if I in the future give you 100 only, then you are missing on the interest which you could have earned on the investment had you done if I have paid you earlier. So this basically becomes the 10% over here becomes your cost of capital. The cost, it's basically the opportunity cost, right? If I'm not paying you today, you're losing out on 10 rupees extra. This becomes your cost of capital. So the higher this will be, so perhaps if the bank is offering you 20% interest, higher is going to be the opportunity cost also. So the bigger the discount rate, the bigger is going to, uh, the smaller is going to be the value in today's time. So if you see over here, these are the discount rates. If it's 1%, uh, let's suppose 100 rupees you are supposed to take from someone in one year's time and your cost of capital is 1%. So you will multiply 100 with 990. So the 100 rupees that you will, uh, receive in the future it's only going to be 99 rupees in today's time so the hundred that you are receiving after one year if you talk about how much it is worth today it's only worth 99 rupees today similarly if your cost of capital is 10 percent if you see this value over here so the 10 percent that you see over here if this is the cost of your capital, then the 100 rupees that you are due to receive after one year, it's how much will that be worth? 91 rupees roughly. So uh, the higher you take your discount rate over here, it was 99 rupees. But as your discount rate went up, the present value reduced, isn't it? So the higher the discount rate is going to be higher, uh, the lesser is going to be the present value. Uh, with this concept, we go on to answer this question. We have to answer which will be most consistent with maximizing the wealth of the 
shareholders. So profit maximization, again, something which can definitely help. But we, uh, we, uh, we also discussed yesterday how this is not a good proxy of maximizing the wealth of the shareholders do you remember from yesterday's class we were discussing how in real life short term you know they are trying to substitute yeah yeah so they are trying to substitute uh, wealth maximization with profit maximization but this is not good so that's why this cannot be our answer market share growth again is something which can indirectly lead to the wealth uh, maximization but let's read the other options also minimizing the company's cost of capital so like we were talking about cost of capital over here if this cost from 10 percent has gone to one percent this cannot be the case in real life but i'm giving you an example over here if the cost of the uh, cost of capital of the company was 10 percent but with good negotiation the managers have reduced the cost of capital to let's suppose five percent so the cost has gotten half, right? So when you are using the discount rates, what you're going to get is when the uh, cost of capital gets reduced, uh, if you're going to receive 100 rupees after one year, when the cost of capital was 10%, how much? How much discount rates are of what? Uh, discount rates of? The cost of capital. Okay. According to how much your cost of capital is, how much your money is worth in today's okay. time. So these are the years that are mentioned. So if you are getting some money after five years and your cost of capital is 10%, then this becomes the present value factor. Whatever is going to be the money that you're supposed to receive, you multiply that with this value. This will give you the value in today's time. So uh, how much are 500 rupees after five years multiplied with this value will give you how much it is worth in today's money. So this is what we mean by the present value. Uh, coming back to the company that we were discussing about. So if we are minimizing the cost of capital, uh, probably what was 90 rupees now becomes 95 rupees. So if the cost of capital goes down, overall cost of company's capital goes down, then the future cash flows that they make also increase, even though if uh, the same 5 million remains the same 5 million, but because the discount rate has value. gone down, the value will increase, isn't it? So this minimizing the company's cost of capital can definitely help you maximize the wealth of the shareholders. Maximizing earnings per share also is something which can, which is a part of the shareholders wealth. But ultimately, when you are working to minimize the cost of capital, the benefit that the shareholders are going to get is going to be higher in this scenario. Right? So that's why option C is the answer. Any queries in this one, any option that you want me to repeat any statement? Is it clear? Uh, a confirmation from the online students also? Um, can you once go back to the question? Yeah, sure. I'm maximizing EPS with the OE sector, like. Uh, maximizing EPS is definitely a component of the wealth of the shareholders, but ultimately, if you talk about the future cash flows, the future cash flows are only going to, you know, be of more value once the cost of capital is minimized. Uh, if you see what I explained over here, if the cost of capital gets reduced, the same amount of money is worth more in today's times, isn't it? So that's why, uh, you know, working towards minimizing the cost of capital is going to help you maximize the wealth of the shareholders does that help acha acha cool cool got you okay can you please explain me what is the meaning of cost of capital Sure. Uh, we will study this in detail, but I have gotten a query to explain the cost of capital again. So the example that we were discussing over here, that uh, let's go back to that example that I have 100 million worth of capital. 50 million is equity, 50 is debt. So the debt holders are demanding 9% interest on the debt that they have given to me. 9% is the interest that they want. Otherwise, they will take their money back and shareholders are wanting a return of 13 percent so this is basically the amount of money the amount of uh, you know return 
that I need to earn on the capital invested to be able to just meet the cost of my capital. Only when I meet this, then I will have something extra for uh, future uh, investments in my business. So just the, you know, nobody is going to give you money for free, right? There is no free lunch in the world. So even if you think of, you know, borrowing money from your friend, uh, you are borrowing 100 rupees, probably, you know, uh, if he's a, a person who is who knows ba basic math and you're borrowing for a significant amount of time, he's going to ask you for interest. So interest basically is nothing but the cost that you incur to use someone's money. Why, why would someone give you their money? They could put their money in FDs and get some interest. So it's basically the opportunity cost that, you know, someone would with themselves and were not giving them as a loan, right? So this is the cost of capital. Um, and averaging that out will give you the weighted average cost of capital, which is also something which we're going to discuss in very much detail. And you're going to work full-fledged numericals of uh, this topic. Uh, is it here now? Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so this was about this question. I'm moving ahead. Any queries? Right, so the third question is going to be answered by you. Read out the question also once you are ready. In the meantime, rest of you also keep thinking. Can you read the question also? Which of the five statements is correct? Okay. Profit maximization result in the shareholder wealth maximization, diverse of ownership and control can lead to agency cost. Maximizing EPS results in shareholder wealth maximization. Increasing market share will lead to increase shareholder wealth. So, what's your answer? C. Okay, let us read the statements one by one. Uh, the first statement says profit maximization results in shareholder wealth maximization. Would anyone like to comment whether this is right or wrong and along with the reason? 70% true. Ma'am, we discussed the case uh, earlier like uh, we can maximize the profit for the present time by reducing the cost of input. But by reducing the quality, we would uh, hamper the uh, right. prices in the future. Absolutely. So it could exactly. Not be done. So profit maximization is more of a short-term achievement. If you are degrading on the quality to minimize the cost, you are maximizing your profits. But ultimately, in the long term, you're not going to be able to achieve shareholder wealth maximization. That's why first statement is incorrect. Now, before we read the second statement, there's one thing let's uh, discuss. So talking about management and talking about shareholders. So if I have these two people, shareholders are who? For the company, shareholders are what? The owners. And the management is what? Well, management is doing what people who, are working for people who are working people who are the agents people who are controlling the company running the day-to-day -day operations so if we read the statement now uh, the statement says that divorce of ownership and control can lead to agency costs so if we see over here management and shareholders basically they are uh, controlling and ownership has become separate with this agency relationship of uh, you know shareholders being the principals and management being the agent so because of this agent and uh, principal relationship you see that the ownership and control has gotten separated so because they are separated what is incurred agency costs so that is exactly what this statement says the statement says that the divorce the separation of ownership and control can lead to agency costs so this is correct 
let's also see why C and D are incorrect. Maximizing EPS results in shareholder wealth maximization. Now, a lot of you would think that this is correct. Somewhat true. Somewhat true. But let me uh, give uh, an example to say why this is not correct. So perhaps uh, what I'm a very smart manager, what I do is that currently my EPS would be, uh, let's suppose 100 divided by 10. So this will be 10 rupees per share. Okay. This is what the current ratio will look like. Uh, 10 is the number of shares. This is a very small example that I'm taking. So now what I do is I announce a, a, a split, a stock split. So the shares which were worth 1 rupees, they are now worth going to be worth 0 0.5. Or uh, let's suppose it's going to be worth 2 rupees. So anyone who was having one share, uh, so anyone who was having two shares is now basically going to have one share. This is a, a corporate action which the companies are pretty much, you know, entitled to do at any time. Uh, they are probably trying to uh, accumulate the capital. They are trying to make the share a bigger share. So what they do is uh, anything which was worth uh, one, now it's only reduced to 0 0.5. So anyone who earlier had two shares now only has one share. So the number of shares also gets reduced to half. So now the same 100 rupees which I had over here. But the cost won't get doubled like this. Uh, let me just finish this. I'll get back to you. So 100 now, that same is going to be divided by 5 because I've consolidated my shares. Now the same uh, EPS is going to be what? 20. So I'm a very smart manager. What I did was I decreased the number of shares so that the EPS becomes high. But does did this actually maximize the wealth of the shareholders? No, right? It's just a way of presenting things differently. So this is not true that always maximizing the EPS will lead to maximization of shareholders' wealth. Then uh, that's why this statement but becomes... Is it possible the shareholders would allow it, right? Uh, there are because corporate actions that companies keep taking that perhaps if the share has fallen to a very low value and the company thinks that because of the low value so perhaps uh, let's take an example merge bhi hota hai. Uh, so let's see over here let's suppose uh, there was a company the share initially got listed at 100 rupees the nominal value was 100 it got listed at 100 so what happened that there was a bad news about the company consistent bad news bad performance the shares have actually fallen down to let's suppose 30 rupees so do you think that to an investor who does not know that the company has you know been consistently performing bad do you think it's going to look good in front of a person that a share that was worth 100 rupees has now only been reduced to 30 rupees. So this is a tactic. This is It's also legitimate to do this. Companies will try to merge the shares. So just to, uh, you know, probably uh, take two shares and merge them into one, make it at least 60. Something that was worth 100 is, and now still 60 is going to look bad, but what else can you do? So probably to improve the picture of the business, consolidation can also take place uh, again there are a lot of ways that the man uh, the management can try to manipulate the eps they can also uh, you know instead of issuing more equity they can issue more debt so that the denominator does not increase that is why uh, eps is also something which is subject to manipulation what do we uh, what is the formula that we use for eps the pat Minus preference dividend. This is the numerator, right? What uh, the PAT is something which is a an accounting figure, a figure which we get from the books of accounts, a figure which the management prepares. So this is also very much subject to manipulation. That is why uh, EPS also maximizing that alone is not the ultimate solution to maximizing the wealth of the shareholders. Uh, do you understand why C will not be the answer now? Talking about option D, increasing market share will lead to increased shareholder wealth. So even if, let's suppose, uh, I increase my market, perhaps uh, the, the entire pizza industry is, let's suppose, $100 billion uh, worth. And uh, let's suppose Domino's currently has 50 of this. Now, to increase the market share, what they do is their biggest competitor is who? 
who's the biggest competitor yeah. of domino's pizza hut so to compete with them they try to half their prices half their selling prices <laughs> now because of this huge discount india is a very price sensitive market uh, so because of this discount let's suppose they are able to take up their market share from 50 to 70% now even though they have been able to increase their market share but will their profits increase they have increased their market share but at the cost of they are uh, giving the discount so because of giving discounts their profit margins are going to shrink and this is not really going to help with wealth maximization for the shareholders is this clear this option why this is not correct so that's why option b is going to be our answer moving ahead uh you are going to give me the answer for this one which of the following is the best indicator of shareholder wealth market price of the share see okay and can you give me the reason also okay so let's go option wise you all know the requirement we have to select which is the best indicator of the wealth of the shareholders so if you talk about pbit pbit only gives you an incomplete picture because interest is not been subtracted taxes have not been subtracted mm -hmm. and how much are the number of shares that's also because you know this that amount of profit is going to be divided among all of the shareholders so you do not really know how much one shareholder is getting then talking about sales revenue do you think this is a good indicator even if the sales revenue has shot up a lot perhaps your costs have also shot up so that does not really give you an indicator of how much the shareholders are doing well then if you talk about market price of the share now like we were discussing that the value of the company is going to be the present value of all of its future cash flows similarly in the stock market it is believed that whatever is the market price of the share the market price of the share is also the present value of all the future cash flows that a shareholder can possibly earn from the company so all of the dividends that the company pays all of the capital gains that could Uh, could be there so the market price of the share is considered to be a very good indicator of how good a stock can turn out to be if you talk about uh there are also exceptions to this um there are the fundamentally good companies who whose share prices will artificially also go up but if you talk generally market price of the share will definitely give you uh, an insight into what the future prospects of the company look like and then pe ratio uh, i don't think you would know what pe ratio is as of now but we will also learn more about this so pe ratio is nothing but uh, if you see the name itself pe is price upon earnings so the price is nothing but the market price of the share so perhaps the market price is 10 rupees and earnings how much that share has earned in terms of the dividends so uh, uh, sorry in terms of the earnings itself so it's basically uh, your uh, the profit after tax divided by the number of shares because that's the money that is left for the shareholders so the, perhaps the earnings that you have is let's suppose 2 so on spending 10 rupees you have earned 2 rupees on investing 10 rupees you have been able to earn 2 rupees that's essentially what the pe ratio shows you so over here if you talk about the best indicator it's got to be the market price of the share because it's it gives you the present value of all the company that is uh, capable of in doing in the future shall i move ahead is this clear to all of you online batch can i have a confirmation great Let's talk about the fifth one now. Who's going to give me an answer? Can I have a raise of hand instead of me pointing out? Anyone? Anyone with an answer yet? 
you will not have so much of time d okay someone says a someone says d any other options someone say b and c also so let's discuss we have to select something which is not a consequence or a symptom of the agency problem agency problem is again the problem that arises because of the separation of management and shareholders so first of all the option says managers diverting funds to their own pet projects so do you think this is a problem that arises because of the agency problem yes yes right because probably the managers will try to uh, window dress the books take some funds out and probably make some of their own investments to make their own money because you know perhaps they think that the bonuses or the salaries that they get are not really good enough for them so this can be a consequence of the agency problem is uh, are we clear with yeah. this uh, is it clear to you okay option b says managers selecting quick payback projects do you understand uh, quick payback what does that mean the money come back quickly comes back quickly so uh, do you think managers will be selecting such projects because of the agency problem exactly definitely yes because they want to maximize their bonuses bonuses are majorly short term targets that they are supposed to achieve so they will definitely try to pick up projects that give them money more quickly so that they get higher bonuses so again this is something which is a consequence then managers engaging in empire building now what do we mean by empire building so basically they are trying to use the powers in their hands to their own advantage to probably gang up against the shareholders so there's a entire board of uh, directors so if they all join hands and probably do something against the shareholders that's uh, an example of what empire building could be so this is also again a problem that we face because of the agency problem because they are fed up or probably they don't feel that their pay is good enough so this is something which they can possibly do now talking about the last option managers increasing the company's level of financial gearing do you remember what gearing is from yesterday um, increasing debt increasing the level of debt the company has so if managers are doing that do you think this has anything to do with the agency problem why what benefit will they get by uh, doing this uh th that could be a possible thing but uh you know even managers will not go on to increase the financial gearing by because what happens is so uh we were talking about the gearing uh what happens is when uh with debt comes risk would you guys agree with me on that if you are the owner of a company you are uh, and you know the company that you own is taking more and more of debt what will happen Th their interest payments interest commitments will increase the amount of profits that you earn majority chunk of it is going to go in interest payments and whatever you get is only after the subtracting of that interest so the more debt a company takes the more risky it becomes for the shareholders because the lesser is going to be there for them the, the remaining so uh, definitely if the risk that the shareholders take so if you're taking more risk in an investment that you have done wouldn't you also want a higher return to com to be compensated for the high amount of risk that you are taking these all these two things risk and reward always go in proportion if i am taking more risk i expect more return if i am taking lesser risk i am just putting my money in fd fd is going to give me a lesser rate of return so managers will not really want to increase the level of gearing by a whole lot figure because if that happens shareholders are going to demand a higher rate of return and that's going to become difficult for the managers because the projects are giving the same returns right which they were earlier also giving so that is why Op uh, option d is something which is not going to be the consequence or a symptom of the agency problem clear to all of you is it clear to everyone online patch can i have a confirmation are you here with me okay i move ahead 
Hathaway Company. So this is a calculation question. I want all of you to be solving this. Uh, has you have to find out the total shareholder return. This we did yesterday as well. Uh, you have the dividend, you have the share price, and you have the previous share price also. So you have to find out the total return. Uh, yeah. Let me know once you guys have worked it out and then I'll show you how it's calculated also. Right. <clears throat> From the next time onwards, I want your calculators to be there instead of your phones. No, no, no. practice to get your hand sorted. Ma'am, is it eight point six? Uh, no, it's not 8.6. Uh, let me show you the calculation. So how much is the dividend given? I'll have to switch back. 0.21. And so this is the first component. Second component is the capital gain. How much is the price today? 3.5. How much was the price one year back? 3.6. And denominator is going to be the initial price, 3.6. So if you work this out, I think you're going to get your answer as option C, which is 3.1%. Is that correct? So this is how you work this out. Uh, so Nali, how were you working out to get uh, the answer that you were getting? Ma'am, for me, formal. I'm confused. No, get. So, I have previous uh, previous year less uh, uh, current year. Got it. No, the formula that we learned yesterday was current minus previous, and in the denominator, oh, well. it's previous, right? So, it's very natural to be confused uh, in the initial times. But please be very sure that you have the formula correctly, right? Correct, ma'am. Thank you. I move ahead now. I hope it's clear to all of you. Great. So they have shown this also. You can also do this way instead of putting in the decimals, you can uh, convert it into, but you do not really need to manually do that. The calculator does the calculations for you. Uh, this is a very easy question. Um, who will volunteer to answer this? Uh, before you answer, I would like to explain what's an operating cycle because we have not really covered uh, all of the portions over here. So operating cycle is basically the time that it takes for a business that to buy the raw materials and eventually once it has made the sales and money has come back to the business. To buy the raw materials, money goes out. And when you actually sell it in the external market, that is when you receive money. So the entire length of this uh, cycle is what you call your operating cycle. So basically, it has the days that you take, uh, the days that your inventory stays in your inventory until you're not able to sell it, the days that you take to uh, you know, pay your suppliers, the days that the uh, supply, your suppliers take to pay you. So this is all uh, the, you know, what are the components of your operating cycle will be. So you will have inventory holding period. Like the whole financial uh, not the financial, it's not necessary. So perhaps, uh, probably I buy my raw material. Let's suppose what's the day today? It's the 10th of March. So on 10th of March, I buy my raw material. Let's suppose my raw material is uh, $10,000. Then uh, I have bought this on credit. Okay. Uh, after 10 days, I make this payment of $10,000. After 15 days, my receivables give me the payment. Then uh, my inventory stays in my inventory for, let's suppose, 10 days. I'm not able to sell it for X, Y, Z reason. For 10 days, the inventory remains stuck. So as long as the inventory is stuck with me, will I have any 
you know money coming in no right the only once the inventory is sold out only then i'm going to get the money with me so operating cycle is the amount of time the number of days that it takes for you to buy the money uh, to buy the inventory process that uh, raw materials to create your finished good and then sell off that finished good eventually in the market so this is what your operating cycle will be now inventory turn over period ki karenge uh yeah the periods will basically be added and subtracted to work out the operating cycle we will learn the formula and everything you will also learn to calculate it so just to explain you that i had paused now you can get back to the question any volunteers you can try there's no penalty on giving a wrong answer a b c will decrease the share a and c will decrease yes b and c okay do i have an answer same answer ma'am b and c will decrease and a and c will increase okay mm so let's read the statements one by one uh we have to identify which will increase or decrease the shareholder wealth so the first statement reads average cost of capital is increased by a financing decision now when i was talking to you on the tables that we were seeing on the screen you saw how if the cost of capital was going up uh you know we were uh, the present value was going lesser so if the cost of capital has gotten increased the present value becomes lower and that actually reduces your shareholders wealth are you all with me on this clear to all of you okay so the first one will decrease the wealth of my shareholders now talking about operating cycle becoming longer again what is happening is the time that i'm taking to have money back in my business is longer so it means trouble for my company that is why this is also decreasing the wealth of the shareholders now board of the directors have accepted a project with which has a negative net present value so like i was telling you net present value is the present value of all the cash flows that the project is going to give you subtracted with the initial investment and everything so it's the net that you get in return of taking a project so if that is negative that means you are essentially making a loss you're making a loss if you have a project with a negative yeah. npv so do you think making a loss is going to increase or decrease shareholder wealth mm -hmm. decrease. decrease then the annual report declares full compliance with the corporate governance code so is it a good thing or a bad good thing good thing which will help me increase, increase the wealth of the shareholders is this question clear to all of you yes uh, online students also clear yes ma'am great yes ma'am great now i move ahead uh which two of the following statements about not for profit organizations are correct uh someone from the online batch can potentially answer this sonali i come back to you sure ma'am which two of the following statements about npo are correct npo often have multiple stakeholders with conflicting objectives the provision of value for money embodies economy equality and effectiveness no npo usually have one dominant stakeholder no the key financial objective for npo is to the key financial objective for npo is to provide value for money <coughs> <clears throat> what do you think the answer i think i think a a is would be definitely correct and the provision for value for money embodies uh, no b to nahi and we should usually have dominant stakeholder i think a and d might be the answers okay uh, that's correct congratulations on giving me the right answer so let's also discuss the first statement reads not for profit organizations have multiple stakeholders with conflicting objectives is this correct yes. right so we also revised this when we were talking uh, earlier today so there will be multiple stakeholders and there may be conflicting objectives 
also so this statement is one of the answer also be very careful when you have to select two three four this number is specified and highlighted if at all you are selecting lesser options or more options you get a zero straight away no matter how many are correct uh so select the exact number uh, then talking about part B, it says provision of value for money embodies economy, quality, and uh, equality and effectiveness. Is this correct? No. Uh, what is the E which is wrong over here? Efficiency, Efficiency is missing and equality, equality is not is one of the three E's. So that's why this gets eliminated. Now, not-for-profit organizations usually have one dominant stakeholder. This may or may not be true. So this is not necessary. Hence, cannot be our answer. The key financial objective for NPOs is to provide value for money, which is what we have learned. Right. So A and D are our answers. Exactly the number that has been asked. I'm selecting that. Only then you're going to get the marks. Moving to question number nine. Ma'am, both if we choose two options and one of them is wrong and another is zero. Clear. Zero. Right. So which of the following statements about financial management are correct? Uh, we are going to go statement wise and you are going to tell me if it's right or wrong. The first statement you go, it is concerned with investment decisions, financing decisions and dividend decisions. Correct. So option C has gotten eliminated over here. Elimination also works very well in some cases of MCQs. So you can also use this technique. Let's go to second statement. It may use information from management accounting. Is that true? Yes, ma'am. Yes, that is true. We have learned how it is related to uh, both management accounting as well as financial accounting. So financial managers will also perhaps use the information to predict companies' future cash surpluses and deficits. Then the third state, uh, so we are now at the third statement, it must hedge all of the company's currency risks. Um, so this is not correct. Uh, we will also be learning about this in, we have a syllabus area called risk management, where we'll be talking about foreign exchange risks. So there are multiple types of risks that can arise. So uh, one sort of a risk is a translation risk. So what happens is uh, perhaps, uh, let's take the example of Reliance. Reliance operates in multiple countries. Uh, they have some of their factories in US, Canada also. So what happens is probably the revenues which have been reported by Canada, Canada will be in uh, Canadian dollars. US will be in US dollars. So when at the time Reliance is publishing its financial statements in India, there is a risk that because of, you know, some error made in the rounding off, some errors that were made due to wrong interest uh, exchange rates being used, there is a risk that the translation has not been done correctly. So a financial manager cannot really do much about this risk. They can definitely uh, help you hedge risks which pertain to values of a currency falling. Perhaps we have to receive dollars from someone. So there are ways to hedge that risk, but there is no way to hedge the translation risk. That is why this statement over here says it must hedge all currency risks, which cannot be possible. So option one and two are correct. That gives option A as your answer. Clear to all of you? Um, the offline batch is requesting me for a break over here. Do you guys also want a break? Anything will suffice, ma'am. I mean, not a necessity, but if, if they want, we can go on with definitely. <laughs> we have a significant number of students over here. So uh, let's take a break for 10 minutes. It's currently 148. We meet at 158. Hi, are all of you back? Give me a quick confirmation, please. Great. Uh, we begin with the next question. Uh, who's going to answer this? I'll probably ask uh, Saddam. Can you answer this one? Maxim maximizing the market share is an example of, sorry, uh, which of the following st statements are correct? 
maximizing the market share is an example of financial objective shareholders wealth maximization is the primary financial objective for a company listed on a stock exchange financial objective should be quantitative so that their achievements can be measured okay so so Ma'am, not clearer. Huh? So you can explain. What's uh, would you want to maybe guess? Uh, <laughs> any guess? Uh, the two and three. Answer number C. Two and okay. three. Uh, that's the correct answer. Uh, let's uh, go deep into the statements one by one. Maximizing market share is an example of a financial objective. Is it? Is it? Anyone who thinks it is? You already know the correct answer now. Why would you? So market share definitely is going to help you in the long term if it is sustainable and is not at the cost of uh, you know discounts and everything. Uh, but it cannot be the financial objective. Financial objective will always be about uh, wealth maximization. Uh, then talking about the second statement. Ma yeah. First statement is of what objective? Uh, it says that maximizing market share is a financial objective. It could be, it could be uh, falling under other objectives. Uh, we have not really studied about the other classifications. We have studied the financial objectives. In, under financial objectives, you have the maximization of shareholder wealth. It could be certain other objectives, probably regarding uh, you know growth objectives, market objectives. It could fall under those classifications. We do not really have them. Those classifications as a part of our syllabus. But uh, it says that it's the part of financial objective, which it is not. That is why this will not be the correct statement. Uh, shall I move to statement two now? Uh, this says that wealth maximization is the primary financial objective for a company that's listed on a stock exchange, which is exactly what we have studied. So this is a correct statement. Financial objectives should be quantitative so that their achievement could be measured. Just what I was talking about in the afternoon today when we started that uh, it's very easy to compare numbers, but it's very difficult to compare qualities. The, something could be better in another thing, something could be better in the other. So qualities are difficult to compare, but whenever you have a quantity, you can clear cut, rank the numbers and achieve at uh, the analysis. So financial objectives, if they are quantitative, definitely would be easy to uh, see whether or not they have been achieved. So two and three are correct. And that's our answer. Um, we have moved to the next question now. Which of the following is least likely to be within the scope of financial management? And anyone from you, please answer this. This is very simple. You have the answer, right? What about others? The one who is not able to answer uh, this. Anyone? Yeah, exactly. So can you also explain to the rest of the class why this will be the answer? Uh, Non-executive directors are appointed as a remuneration committee. So uh, appointing people is not one of the criteria that we come across while the financial management. Right, and also to eval, uh, so to it's eliminate like uh, not really management accounting. Also, so let's uh, go option wise. First of all, dividend payment very much a part of your dividend decisions, which is a part of financial management. Funds raised to finance an investment project again, investment decision part of financial management. Surplus assets are sold off again, part of your investment decisions. So financial management. Option D says non-executive directors are appointed to the remuneration committee. Basically, this is the work of the board of directors, nothing to do with financial management. So this does not really fall in the plate of a financial manager, what a manager would do. So this is what your answer is going to be because we have to select which is least likely. So I move on. Clear to all of you? Uh, online students, clear to all? Great. Uh, 
moving ahead uh this is again a calculation question please take uh take out whatever you want to do to calculate <coughs> Let's work at that. D is what major majority of you are getting. Have you taken the dividend correctly? It's in cents. Yes, ma'am. I have then zero point twenty one. Right. Majority are getting D. Uh, let's also work this out. So we have a dividend of twenty one cents. So zero point two one is my dividend. This is my first component. Second component is going to be the difference between the present price and the one year previous uh, price. So three point five minus three point one, and then I divide this with. 3.1. So whatever is, um, yeah, into 100 is going to give it to you in percentage. So uh, what's the answer that you get on working this out? 19.7. So that's the right answer. What was the mistake that you would have made? Okay. Clear to all of you? Yes, ma'am. Online students also, shall I move ahead? Clear to all? Yes, ma'am. Great. Uh, value for money is an important objective for not for profit organizations. Uh, you're going to tell me the answer. Okay, so let's go over these statements one by one. We have to find out which is least consistent with value for money. So the first statement reads, using cheaper source of goods without decreasing the quality of the services. So do you think this is consistent with VFM? Yeah. Yes. yes, we are trying to reduce the cost, but we are not making sure that the quality remains the same. So this is something which is consistent, hence eliminated. Searching for ways to diversify the finances for not-for-profit organization. Did we anywhere in Value for Money talk about finances of the organization? No, right? So possibly could be our answer. Let's go over the other statements also. Anyway, we just have to get one option. So let's try to eliminate the other ones. Decreasing waste in the provision of a service by the not-for-profit organization. Effectiveness. Effectiveness definitely will be helpful in providing value for money. That is why this, because this is consistent, this gets eliminated. Talking about option D, focusing on meeting the objectives when you're focusing on meeting of objectives you're you're also working towards value for money because ultimately the objectives are to provide the most benefit at the least possible cost so option b was something which we did we were not able to link to any of the e's that we have studied in vfm that is why option b is our so we are Using because of inputs, it's economy. We are reducing the cost of our inputs. Mom, but it isn't saying that the cost should be reduced. It's saying the see. Uh, let me take you back to the slides. The very definition that we studied for economy. So if you see the definition over here for economy, 
it's securing resources as economically as possible. So minimizing the costs of your inputs, which is exactly what this statement says, that using a cheaper source of goods. So you're actually minimizing the cost of your inputs. That's why, according to me, it should fall in economy. So what's the difference between economy and uh, efficiency? Efficiency is, so perhaps, uh, let's suppose you are making a good making a good as a part of doing mm -hmm. charity. So to make one good, uh, one unit of whatever you're making, it's supposed to take five units of raw materials. But because you are doing a good job, you are able to do it at four. So usually it takes five kg of raw material to make one unit. Mm -hmm. But because you're doing it nicely, you're only taking four kgs of raw material. So uh, earlier, you would have to produce, let's suppose, 100 units. You would have needed 500, but you did the job of 500 within 400. So that makes you efficient. Uh, that's the difference between efficiency and economy. Uh, so option B is the answer over here. Any queries, shall I move ahead? Uh, online students also, shall I go ahead? Yes, ma'am. Great. Uh, question 14. In which of the following principal agent relationships is the principal named second? So over here we have a list. We have to select the option in which principal's name has been put in the second place. So uh, go ahead and uh, read and let me know your answers. B part. B part. Uh, D part says. B -B. Okay, B part says company and the customers. So, you, customers yeah, so customers are named first and the principal is the company. That is what you're saying. Um, okay, any other answers? Any other answers? Do more thinking. Ma'am, option C, shareholders and debt holders. Debt holders uh, should be the principal here and the owners, shareholders are the agents. Very good. Would you also like to explain this to your fellow learners, why this is the answer and why the other ones are not the answers? Uh, because the share debt holders are the principals here as... Uh, so uh, okay uh, good attempt i will explain the question from here so basically if we talk about the first example shareholders are the principals and managers are the agents so that is why this gets eliminated clear till here option b says customers and the company first of all let me know is there any principal agent relationship between the customers and a company are, is the company doing anything on the behalf of the customers, which is be, which is the responsibility of the customers, but the company is doing that? Nothing sort of this exists, right? So this option also gets eliminated. Talking about shareholders and debt holders. If you talk about shareholders, they're essentially the owners of the company. And debt holders are who? They have given the owners of the company some money on loan. So if they have given the money on loan, don't they become the principal because the shareholders are answerable to them if they do not pay their interests on time, if they are not repaying their capital back on time, aren't the shareholders answerable? Indirectly, yes, but usually it's the management that will be running the company. But if you see it on paper terms, on paper, shareholders are the owners, right? So they will be the ones who the debt holders will hold accountable if there is any sort of default in this uh, relationship, uh, principal but agent. We have learned before in your class that shareholders are major owners or the principal owners of the company and others are the agents of them. That may be the credit. We have learned, we have not learned that others are the uh, agents. We have learned that the shareholders are the owners, and because they have appointed the management on their behalf to do the day to day responsibilities and work, only the managers become the agents of the shareholders. So, this is the relationship which we have learned so far. And uh, again, coming back to this uh, statement, that debt holders are actually the people who have lent money to the company 
and company is owned by the shareholders so indirectly uh, shareholders are the ones who are accountable who will you know if the company defaults the debt holders are going to go to the shareholders that we want our money back now they are acting as an agent yeah so yeah. basically shareholders are the ones who are supposed to on the money of the debt holders they are supposed to generate that minimum rate of interest and also repay their capital back on time right does that help so let's move to the last one again employers and employees basically the company the employer is going to hire employees to do work on their behalf so it's the employees who become the agent and not the principal mm -hmm. principal is the employer mm -hmm. so uh, option c is your answer clear to all of you shall i move ahead clear to all yes ma'am Question 15 now, uh, you answer, you. Which of the following statement is the main objective of financial management? A. Efficient equation of the end deployment of financial process to ensure achievement of objective. B. Providing information to management for day-to-day functions -day of control and decision making. Be providing information to obtain external users from the historic result of the organization. Be maximization of shareholder value. Okay, don't you think D? Why not D? <laughs> okay, so I have an answer in the offline class that is going to be A. What do you guys think? It's the financial objective. Uh, sorry, I could not hear. What do you think the answer is going to be? The offline students say it's A. Ma'am, B, B, I feel. You're thinking it's B? No, no, A and D. I mean, we, it, there could be two. Uh, okay, it could be A or it could be D. That's what you're saying? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So we all agree that it's not B and it's not C, yes, right? Yes, uh, B says providing information to management for day-to-day -day functions of control and decision making. Not this is not financial management, but this is what? Uh, management accounting. Exactly. This is management accounting. Talking about statement C, providing information to external mm -hmm. users about the historic results, which is this? Accounting. Exactly. This is financial accounting. So B and C are totally eliminated. Now we're left with A and D. So um, D says maximization of shareholder wealth, which we have studied that is the financial objective of financial management. And if we see A, it says efficient acquisition and deployment of financial resources to ensure achievement of objectives. Uh, I just closed the PPT, but I wanted to take you back to the definition of financial management. So the very definition that we read yesterday said that it is concerned with the efficient acquisition and use of short term and long term financial resources, which is exactly what is mentioned over here. So this becomes the correct answer. Clear to all of you? Clear to the offline, uh, sorry, the online students also? Yes, ma'am. Great. I now move ahead. Uh, so question number 16 says, ARP is a charity providing transport for people visiting hospitals. Which of the following performance measures would best fit with efficiency in a money review, value for money review? You're, you're supposed to highlight the one which is associated with efficiency.
Any answer? Okay, a lot of you are thinking that it's going to be C. Uh, let's go statement by statement. Percentage of members who reuse the service. What do you think that this could be associated with? Which of the three okay. measures that we have studied over here? Uh, yes, these are the three measures here right in front of you. The first option read uh, percentage of members who reuse the service. What do you think this could be? Exactly. So I have a student answering that this could be effectiveness. So using resources as effectively as possible. This is what percentage of members who reuse the service would mean. Meaning that, you know, we have the buses, we have whatever is needed for transportation. The more number of people that uses, that means the more effectively we are using our resources. Uh, cost of uh, cost per journey to the hospital. So if we read the definition of efficiency, efficiency says you have to maximize what the output to input ratio. So if you see over here, cost per journey to the hospital. So uh, cost per journey, if you see, it's basically the amount of money it is taking you to move to the destination. So it's basically how much input you are putting in to achieve the output. Output is what? Reaching to the hospital. And it, input would be the cost of the fuel, the fuel that is uh, used in this. So this will best fit with efficiency. Now, if we are comparing the actual operating expenses against the budget, what are we looking at over here? You can read the definitions also. What do you think that this could closely relate to? The uh, statement says comparison, sorry. How? Uh, we are comparing the past with the uh, today's value. So you're saying that it's effectiveness because we're comparing the past with the present. But anywhere in the definition, uh, does it say? possible uh, we see that is it possible to meet the organizational objectives or not so basically if you see this would more or less fit with economy why would it would that be because in the economy we are looking at minimizing the cost of the input and operating expenses are what the costs that we incur to secure the inputs that we are using. So if we are minim we are comparing, we are also going to compare that this should have been the cost and probably we have overspent. So if we are analyzing that, we're trying to be economical. We're trying to reduce the costs of inputs. Then what is going to be about the number of communities served? Okay. Effectiveness. Definitely. Why? Because we have the resource, we have the trucks or vans or whatever are needed for transportation. We have the resource. How many people are we serving with that resource? How many are we able to help with that resource is how effective we are. So this will also pertain to effectiveness. So option B becomes your answer. You can also read this explanation. Uh, percentage of members reusing will be effectiveness, comparison of the expenses will be economy, and number of communities will again be effectiveness because with the resources, we are seeing how effectively we are able to help people. Clear to all of you? Clear to the offline, uh, sorry, the online students also? Ma'am, can you go back to the previous slide? where we have read the financial management definition. OK. No, not this one, um, the ACC study. Oh, OK, OK. This? Okay. No, yes, no. No, please no. confirm. I want to see the answer. Sure. Oh, they are not in the reason. Um, it probably should. So basically, they have eliminated the options over here. They're, they're telling you why B and C and D could not be the answer. And that's why A is the answer. 
Right. So we are finally at the last question, which uh, increasing which two of the following would be associated with the financial objective of shareholder wealth maximization. So, so what all should be increased to maximize the wealth of the shareholders? OK, I have a few people saying D, but if you mark D, you're going to get zero. Just if you mark just D. Give me two. <clears throat> OK, I have few people saying B and C. Hmm? T and E, okay. Any other answers? Okay, let's select all of them. How about that? Um, okay, let's uh, let's go one by one, guys. Let's go one by one over here. So before we do that, first let me know what are we really working out over here. We are talking about shareholder wealth maximization. And how do we find that out? Using what? TSR, total shareholder return. What are the two components? So one is dividend. Dividend. Second component is? Second component is? Capital. Capital gain. And how do you work out capital gain? What do you use? Share price. Both at the end of the year and at the start of the year. So if you read the options, first option over here is share price, which in fact is a component of total shareholder return. Similarly, dividend payment, again, a component of your total shareholder return. So ideally, A and B should be your answer. Reported profit, again, may or may not be the wealth maximization because, again, subject to manipulation and everything could be divided among a lot of people. Earnings per share, again, if you see how we work this out eps does not really form a part of it it's the dividend as well as the capital gain and the very first thing which you should have eliminated over here should have been the weighted average cost of capital because uh cost of capital has nothing to do with how much the shareholders wealth is increasing isn't it so this is the first thing you ideally should have uh, you know, eliminated. So option A and option B are going to be your answer over here. Let's also review what's the explanation that they have given. So the sources of shareholder wealth, like I told you, are the two things which are share price and the dividend. So increasing both of these will directly lead to the wealth maximization of the shareholders. Clear to all of you? Clear to the uh, online students as well? Yes, ma'am. OK, great. So with this, we are through with uh, the questions that we were supposed to cover. We are still left with half an hour. So we are going to resume with chapter two. I can see a lot of you are not really willing to do that. But we have to study and we have to pass FM. So um, let's also quickly go through what we did yesterday. Um, so uh, we talked about the macroeconomic policy. There were a few objectives that we studied that uh, that a macroeconomic policy has. Uh, without looking at the slides, what were those? A few objectives that the government wants to achieve with its policy, the macroeconomic policy. If you are the government, what would you want to do for the people? Exactly. Very good. First is full employment. What else? Mom, equal distribution of wealth. I mean, not one person should accumulate all the wealth in the economy. Exactly. Distribution of wealth. What else? Infrastructure. Yes. Building infrastructure for the people of the country. Having growth. Growth is also something which everyone wants. So these were a few objectives which we discussed yesterday so these are all over here 
as well. And BOP is also something which we missed. Uh, this is about the, uh, you know, the transactions which the people of a country have with the other countries in the world. So this should also be in a balance. I already gave you examples how if one com uh, if one currency is overvalued, it can be a disadvantage for that country also. Uh, I would also like to give you an example over here. Uh, it pertains to China. Uh, Ma'am, if one currency is overvalued, Ma'am, then what's that demerit? I'm coming to it. So let's talk about China. Um, what is China famous for? Cheap labor. Cheap labor, exports. cheap exports. It, it provides you goods for a cheap, very cheap price, which probably no other country in the world is able to do. So the best thing which you all would have come across would be Chinese toys. Chinese toys is a very big market. They are available for a very cheap price. Probably no one else in the world is able to produce those toys at that cost. So what happens is uh, China really wants that because it has the resources, it has the labor, it wants to continue exporting its products to the rest of the world. So what happens is because people buy goods from China, suppose we, we are all sitting here in India, right? And the exporters are in China. So perhaps they would want their payments to be made in the Chinese currency, right? So if we are continuously buying Chinese currency, there is a demand for Chinese currency. Do you agree? We are demanding Chinese currency if we want to buy that. So whenever the demand for something goes up, what happens? Price the prices price. increase. Increases. So uh, that's a different okay we'll come back to it price increase uh, so basically if probably it costed us uh, i'm not really aware of the real rates but let's suppose if 10 rupees was the price to buy one of china's currency probably because of this excessive demand uh, it has shot up to 15. so earlier i could buy one of China, uh, Chinese yuan with 10 rupees but now to buy that same one yuan i need 15 rupees right so it has gotten expensive for me now earlier let's suppose there was uh this one toy that i could get at 10 rupees but now that same toy costs me how much 15 rupees so do you think that this is going to affect how many toys people are going to buy definitely india is a price sensitive market so uh what's uh, what happens is china notices that because its currency has gotten expensive, people have started to buy less. But it still produces the same amount and gradually is increasing its production capacity also. So it, it wants to continue exporting the same figures and also increase those figures. So what it will do is whenever, as soon as this price begins to go near 15, it uh, you know does something it buys other currencies so what happens is if china goes out to buy us dollars it's going to supply its own currency it's going to pay in its own currency to buy us dollars so it's accumulate it is accumulating us dollars that's also good because dollar keeps appreciating in value in the long term and uh, whenever there is a supply for something in the market excessive supply what happens the price Falls. The price falls because the availability is more, so the price will fall. Now, as soon as it continues to come near 15, it goes on to fall because the supply has gotten up. So it continues to buy dollars as long as the price reaches 10 rupees back again. So this is the dirty float that China follows. So basically, there are different exchange rate systems through which exchange rates are determined. It's called the floating exchange rate system, which is usually followed. Uh, the exchange rate is determined by the demand and supply of that currency. But this is a dirty management that China does so that the people continue to uh, you know, buy products from it. So this is what China does. This is a very uh, real life example, which you can see over here. So a solid balance of payments is something which is needed because uh, you were asking that question, right? Who was asking that if the currency is overvalued, what demerit would be there? So this is exactly the demerit. If the currency is overvalued, people are not going to buy your products from the rest of the world, right? Uh, depreciation of own currency. Yeah, this is the depreciation of their own currency. 
So uh, moving ahead, uh, we also discussed yesterday the global economic events. Can any one of you quickly, uh, you know, go through those ones? There were a multiple uh, events that we discussed COVID yesterday. COVID-19, definitely. Enron scandal, uh, which led to the Sarbanes-Oxley Act being introduced in the United States of America. Uh, what else? OK, so there was another thing which we talked about, the Brexit, how exiting of uh, United Kingdom from the European Union led to different consequences for different people. Uh, also, the emerging economies being stronger now, the uh, economies like India, Brazil, these are all developing economies and how they are doing so well that they're challenging the developed economies now. So this is also another important uh, global economic event. Uh, sure. So uh, Brexit, basically, uh, are you aware of the European Union? Yeah. European Union is what? What is it? A community that is formed by the European countries in order to maintain the peace. Right. So in, uh, it's not really to maintain peace. The main objective yeah. is that they want to obtain favorable trade agreements. Yeah. They want to ensure that uh, you know, all of these. So suppose if this is Europe, so all of the countries that lie on this part of the map, they want that all of the transactions that they do with the rest of the world should be in their favor. They want that they should have the best trade agreements and at the best prices, which benefit the European people. Now, what happened is earlier, because uh, United Kingdom also falls apart of the European continent, they were also a part of this European Union. But in uh, 2020 was, uh, you know, the announcement came very early, but in January 2020 was the time when they formally exited from the European Union. It is because that they wanted, uh, so in the European Union, they have agreed that the people who belong to the European Union, so there are countries like Germany, France, Italy, all of these countries forming a part of the European Union. So what happens is that they have mutually agreed that a person from Germany is free to travel in this entire place, wherever the European Union is a part of, and they can work anywhere they want to. They can travel, they can work, they can buy property at favorable rates. Uh, probably if we being Asians, we will not be able to buy the property at the same rates that people in the European Union will be able to buy in another country. So this is how European Union has provided each other favorable trade terms. So uh, Britain, for its own reasons, decided to exit from here. And because so if you also notice the currency that runs in all of the member countries of EU is the euro. They all use the euro currency. Uh, all of the goods and commodities are priced in those currencies and no other country is allowed to have its own currency. So uh, U UK wanted to exit from this. And as a result, all of the agreements which they had with each other. So there were a lot of people from the UK working in different countries, different EU country people working in the UK who could no longer work because the agreement is no longer in place. So there were a lot of implications. A lot of people actually faced difficulties. So perhaps if I was a German working in the United Kingdom, just today I got the announcement that I can no longer work there. I'm jobless. So this is how uh, a lot of this happened over a very large scale. So this impacted the entire global economy. Anything that happens in the United States, in the United Kingdom, is something which affects the entire world. Yeah, exports and imports, exports, imports everything the entire policy changes as a whole so uh, economically there are wide implications for the rest of the world also it just not it just does not merely impact the nations involved but everyone is affected so this is about the brexit and uh, COVID-19, we have already discussed. Uh, there were issues in tourism, supply chains, oil prices, as we discussed, went into negatives. And again, inflation has been caused because of all this mismatch. Uh, then I already told you guys about monetary policy. I want you guys to let me know, one of you, about monetary, and one will tell me about the fiscal policy. What are the two components of fiscal policy? You tell me. Fiscal policy, two components. First of all, monetary and fiscal are both the government that uses, but 
fiscal is something which who manages and monetary who manages? And monetary is managed by the central, central bank, bank on the behalf of the government. So the first difference, fiscal policy, monetary policy, fiscal policy is implemented by the government and the monetary policy is managed by the central, central bank. bank. So this is the first major difference. Now, when we talk about the government, the one which is about the government, what are the two main areas which form a part of the fiscal policy? No. No. So if you talk about the government and the money that the government has, it, there are two parts. One part is the revenue and one part is the cost. What is the revenue for the government? Taxes. taxes and what are the tax costs? Non-tax non -tax non -tax also. Yes. And costs will be infrastructure, infrastructure whatever it does for public welfare and health and everything. So public expenditure will be the cost of the government. Now talking about monetary policy, it was something which was managed by the central bank. What primarily does it control? It controls the inflation. It controls what else? Money supply. What else? Inflation, deflation comes together. Open money money supply, uh, so that's a measure that it uses to implement the policy. Foreign exchange, Foreign exchange. repo rate, reverse repo rate are again the part of their instruments. So what they mainly plan to do is they plan to control the inflation to ensure that it is within the permissible limits, to ensure that the money supply is how much it is supposed to be. It is also responsible for seeing how much money is being printed and everything pertaining to money supply and definitely the foreign exchange reserves. All of the foreign exchange reserves that India holds are lying with the RBI. None of the, none of the reserves are with the government. So uh, monetary policy, again, uh, government or the central bank, the uh, actions that they take to achieve the objectives that they have and using the instruments. We were also discussing the instruments yesterday. You all were giving me some examples also. Let's continue with that. What were the instruments? Open market, Open market operations, yes. What else? What else? You were giving me names earlier, but now you're not. Repo rate. Repo rate. Reverse repo rate, reverse repo rate definitely. Bank so rate. OMO, bank rate, repo rate. Reverse repo rate. What else? What else? Online folks, are you sleeping? Are you here with me? Another instrument? Okay, I'll take you back. So first of all, do you remember what open market operations were? You will tell me what they were. Exactly. So the government either sells or purchases government securities in the open market. If I want to reduce the money supply, what am I going to do? Securities, sell, sell. if we sell the securities to them, they are going to give us the money. So the money from their hands come to my hands. And if I want to increase the money supply, we'll buy the, security. we'll buy the government securities. So uh, this is how open market operations work. Then we also talked about the cash reserve ratio yesterday. This is what the minimum amount of money that they're supposed to be keeping with themselves. So if they increase that ratio, money supply gets reduced because they have lesser money to lend to people. Uh, special deposits, again, we discussed yesterday were a special, like, they do not really know when the RBI can call for that. So again, if they call for the, those deposits, the money supply also gets reduced. Uh, direct control, again, uh, credit controls, they, they can set like, uh, you know, restrictions on the movements that you cannot send money internationally, you cannot loan or, you know, these are the direct controls which the RBI has to ensure that the money supply remains in the permissible levels that they want it to be. Okay. Uh, these were all the direct controls, right? And indirectly was um, through the, yeah. Okay, sure. So direct control says 
the central bank may spe uh, set specific limits on the amount which banks may lend. So I am the RBI, you are a bank, you have 100 crores worth of deposits. I can say that 20% you're not going to lend, no matter what happens. So you're only left with 80 crores to lend. That is a direct control. I have the authority to order you to not lend that 20%. I can do that anytime. So ma'am, like if we have set up like 20% as the value that we won't be able to spend. So does it include the reverse repo rate and repo This is apart of... from those. So ma'am, then so if... So the central bank uses this judicially only when it is actually required for the best interest of the economy. Okay. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, these are planned by very skilled economists and only then such decisions are taken. Uh, then indirectly, we already talked about this also, that the short-term interest rates, if I want people to not have money in their hands, I will increase the deposit rate so people will put in their money over there instead of going out in the economy and shopping. Uh, we also discussed the problems. Anyone remembers what are the problems? <laughs> Ma'am, in the modern and the uh, global economy, a credit control might not be uh, the as, yeah. right. And also the implementation of policies uh, would be time consuming. I mean, planning and actually executing them uh, would also be the problem. Right. Um, so the time lag between the implementation and at the actual results being achieved will also be a problem. And uh, we also discussed that the relationship between these rates, the inflation rates and the level of investments, how much the consumers are consuming, all of this, the relationship between all of these things is also not very predictable. Um, so we also discussed about increasing the interest rates, bringing bad effects. What bad effects could be there if the interest rates are increased? Now, what's the question? If the interest rates, short term deposit interest rates are increased, what is the problem? What are the problems that can be caused because of this? Demand will fall. Demand will fall because people will have what? Lesser amount of money in and their own hands. Will fall because right. they are not able to supply. Yeah. Uh, another problem can be that there will be lesser money for people to put in, in their own businesses. They will be left with lesser money lesser to investment. lesser investments yes exactly so if you read this point lesser investment this will also reduce your capacity how much economy as a whole can produce again this will cause unemployment this is a cycle chain effect one thing triggers the another thing and again like you were telling me downward pressure decreases in consumer demand share prices could also fall because people will take out their money from the stock market and invest in those deposits and overvalued currency, right? Uh, then we also discussed what were the problems uh, that could be faced in reflating, pumping in money back in the economy. What could be the problems over there? Stop reading. What could be the problems in reflating an economy, boosting money again, pumping in more money? Ma'am, there would be more money, there would be more demand. If there would be more demand, then inflation would happen. First of all, the free market was existing so far. The free market gets interrupted, disrupted. Then uh, you also talk about, uh, the again, there will be a time lag here also. The thing that I'm thinking to do and until it actually happens. And ma'am, so, in order to control the money supply, the government will ask for more taxes. And if more taxes will be asked, no, no. the entrepreneurship would lag. No, we are talking about reflating the economy. We are putting in more money so the government will reduce the tax so that people are left with more to spend. So do you think uh, cutting the money also will immediately solve the problem? cutting the taxes. So if you cut your taxes, uh, this will not really help your domestic demand. It will help It will help for exports, but domestic demand will not be boosted because of this. So uh, again, if the uh, another thing is that government can spend more money. If government spends more money, uh, there will be what? I explained you three types of situations when it comes to the government budget. When it comes to government budgets, there are two things. Uh, the government has revenues and the government has expenses. So if the revenues are equal to expenses, what is it called? 
yeah it's a balanced budget and if revenue is more than the expenses then surplus and if revenue is less deficit so if i am spending more money to pump my economy what's going to happen i'm going to run into deficits i'm going to need more money so uh, this is this point over here and again inflation may increase because you're pumping in more money into the economy then what could be the problems in deflating? Now we are trying to reduce the inflation. Ma'am, we won't be able to as taxes are, uh, taxes would be taken, then entrepreneurship would lag. Right. So there are again two things. Either we do something with the revenue or we do something with the expenses. So if we try to increase our revenue, we will have to increase the taxes. But we, if we increase the taxes, the businesses are going to get discouraged because they are going to pay more and more money, the more and more profits Already in the tax. tax. Right. As it is, the businesses are very uh, irritated with the fact that they have to pay 30% of what they earn to the government so this is something which can be problematic then second thing which the government can do is bring the expenses down but can, do you think the government can stop providing for public washrooms for like basic health education infrastructure can they really stop that it's not very possible for the government to cut on those sort of expenditures so this is what we studied uh, about the problems and uh, then, so all of this, we were talking about the demand side. We were talking about how demand can be, uh, you know, manipulated to achieve what we are trying to achieve. So the next topic, we will talk about the supply side policies. So as the name suggests, what do you get from supply side policies? Any guesses? So supply side basically means supply is what? Providing something, providing some sort of a good, providing some sort of a service. So if you're looking at the supply side, we're essentially seeing that the, who are the suppliers in an economy? Who are the suppliers? Who will be the people who will be supplying things? Enterprise. Enterprise, exactly. Business owners and probably some goods, the government also supplies so basically when we talk about the supply side policies we are trying to ensure that we are creating such an environment that the businesses are encouraged to flourish how will businesses flourish what are the you know some measures that the government can reducing do the taxes. reducing taxes okay taxes are one thing what can government possibly do to help businesses grow uh, uh, it's providing it's, subsidies it's providing subsidies. perfect very good what reducing else? Interest rates. Reducing interest rates. Okay, providing probably some cheaper loans to them. Yeah, okay. What else? Uh, have you guys heard of special economic zones? Yes, ma'am. SEZ. SEZs. So they are, you know, there are designated areas in a country where the government, so perhaps if this is one area, the government says in this area, if you come set up your factory, do business over here, I'm going to charge you, let's suppose 5% lesser tax, or there's going to be whatever your tax rate is, you get a flat deduction of 50,000 from whatever the tax payable that you get. So these are a few ways, a few measures that the government can take. Uh, any special uh, zones that you are aware of in India? Yeah. So uh, there are many special zones like these made in uh, Jharkhand. Jharkhand is a state which is a uh, le little less developed when it comes to the economy of the state. So uh, and also a lot of special economic zones have been developed in the northeast of India because, you know, the government wants the development of those states also. So what happens is uh, how do you really think the place benefits if people set up factories over there? Uh, how do the the area benefit employment, employment definitely exactly so new technology, new technology will arrive you know the if the people get infrastructure gets built if you know uh, roads will be built only then people will be setting up factories over there and uh, also the fact that these people now that they are employed they have their own earnings their standard of living also gradually improves so these are a few benefits which arise because of uh, 
uh, you know, having such zones. Uh, so this is exactly what I have mentioned over here. What all could be included in supply side policies? We discussed about low tax rates. Uh, also. Uh, one thing which we did not discuss was the low, uh, you know, government trying to have a stable inflation. If the inflation is very high, businesses will probably be discouraged. So it's also the duty of the government to have the inflation in control. Uh, then uh, limited government spending, uh, government spending in the sense that, you know, not all of the goods are provided by the government so that the private sector can also provide for some sort of goods. Then a balanced fiscal budget. If the government's budget is balanced, then also it becomes a favorable situation for businesses to conduct their business. Deregulation of industries. What do we mean by deregulation? What is deregulation? Sorry. Sorry. Deregulation basically means uh, releasing so basically there are a lot of rules and regulations that a business is supposed to follow so if they reduce those rules and regulations that leads to lower compliance costs and that is how the businesses are helped with deregulation of industries uh reduction in the power of trade unions what are trade unions no not at all what are trade unions Trade unions. The laborers go on strike, something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what happens is, if suppose we have a very big company and uh, that involves doing uh, manual labor work. So what happens is, uh, the labor are going to all come together if at all there's any policy that gets launched which is against them, which you know is not in their benefit. So uh, these trade unions also hamper. Guys, please give me five more minutes. I'm just wrapping up. So uh, if these trade unions have a lot of power, they cause trouble in the business because disruption is caused because of these strikes and whatever they do. And these are the employees. These are the employees, right. So if uh, reduction in uh, the power of these unions is also going to encourage enterprise. Then uh, increasing the training and education, the government is also providing, uh, if you see, uh, uh, I think recently, uh, there were uh, you know initiatives launched by the government where they're training entrepreneurs they are teaching entrepreneurship to the youth of india so these are a few training and education programs that the government can possibly launch to also further encourage businesses uh increase in infrastructure definitely so uh business parks uh, you would have seen dlf cyber hub you would have seen uh the business park in noida i'm not really sure if i get the name so these are a few uh, places that you know help businesses to uh, establish their places of work and eventually conduct their business smoothly and uh, reduction in planning legislation again uh, decreasing the uh, compliance costs basically for them. Uh, Ma'am, could you please explain the reduction in power of trade unions? Reduction in power of trade unions. So trade unions are, uh, do you get first what trade unions are? These are people, uh, probably employees of the organization coming together so that they are able to negotiate for their own good. Labor. Perhaps, yeah, labor. So think of an example where uh, there's a factory and the laborers are mining in that factory. So it involves a lot of physical labor for them to do. It's a difficult job to do. So probably the management has decided to cut their wages from 10 rupees per hour to 8 rupees per hour. So this is something which goes against their favor. So they all come together. They pull on strikes, they go on, you know, uh, dharnas and everything. So this is something which disrupts businesses. If trade unions are very powerful, that means they get the businesses to follow what they want them to follow, which eventually disturbs the businesses because profits get hampered because of this. Hence, uh, reducing up, uh, the power of these trade unions is something which is included in the supply side policies. Clear? All of the points clear? I know you're all in a hurry to leave, but please ask your doubts right here. Any queries? Anything that you want me to go over again? Online batch, all clear to you? Yes, ma'am. All right, then. Uh, the, the session is over for now. Uh, we'll meet next Saturday. All the best. Do keep revising and preparing. Thank you, ma'am.